thank you so much for joining us at Florida Tax Watch. This is going to be a conversation about the laws and rules that are uh, changing for us in the upcoming days. Uh, I think you all know Florida Tax Watch is an independent, nonpartisan public policy think tank dedicated to protecting taxpayer interests. And one of the things that we do, in, uh, including uh, the focus on improving taxpayer value, is raising citizen understanding and making sure that there's government accountability day in and day out in Florida. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing series that we will host each uh, end of the month on the Wednesday of uh, uh, the last week of each month. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on the laws that were passed and going into effect on July 1st. There were 149 of the 280 bills that were passed this last year that have an effective date of July 1st. Uh, don't worry, we're not going to cover them all. We're going to tr try and hit some <laughs> of the highlights and particularly those that have some fiscal uh, impacts. Uh, also want to uh, highlight that we are going to cover a lot of different topics as we go along. And while the question and answer feature is set up for this morning, as well as the chat, we may not be able to get to all your questions. So um, we're gonna try and leave Bob Nave's email address up on the screen, bnave at floridataxwatch.org, or you can contact your favorite Florida Tax Watch employee anytime, and we will try to get back to you after this. I uh, do wanna let you know that we have upcoming programs. In July, we're going to take a short break, but in August, we're going to be talking about uh, the census and the recent um, information that came out about our undercounts, what's the fiscal impact, and what we can do as we go forward, as well as uh, discussing the American Community Survey. After that, um, we'll be focused on illegal trade and the cost and consequences of that to Florida. And we're even going to cover uh, the environment and issues that are coming up during the next legislative session. All those are ahead and we'll send you more details so that you can mark your calendar. But generally speaking, hold the last Wednesday of each month uh, for one of these webinar items. As you know, our work is uh, revolves around research and we're planning our agenda right now. If you've got suggestions for programs or projects that we should be working on, this is a perfect time to reach out to us. Let us know. You can reach me at tcarvajal at floridataxwatch.org or just uh, go onto our research page and you'll find the info at uh, details on our website. Also want to thank each of you who have supported us throughout the year and will continue to support us as we go forward. Our work is made possible by you, not only your recommendations, but your dollars. So thank you for that ongoing support. All right, that's enough of the intro comments. Let's find out what goes into effect on July 1st. And I'm gonna turn the program over to our Senior Vice President, Bob Nave. Uh, Bob, the floor is yours. If you'll tell us a little bit about the laws rules that are coming into effect on July 1st, uh, we're sitting here with bated breath. All right, thank you, Tony, I appreciate that. Before I do that, I want to introduce the Florida Tax Watch research team. Uh, to my left is Meg Canan, a research analyst, and joining us remotely is Kurt Winner, Senior Vice President of Research. Kurt, thank you. We're going to look at, at uh, what the, the 2022 legislature did um, today, and we've divided the laws that were passed into a number of categories. We're going to look at business laws that affect business, uh, laws that affect education, that affect elections, the environment, government, health care, and taxation. And then at the end, we're going to spend some time talking about the three proposed constitutional amendments that will be on the November 8th ballot. So with that, we're going to start, we're going to, have to put a PowerPoint deck up for you to look at. And summarizing the legislature, there were more than 3,700 bills filed in the 2022 legislative session. 285 of those became law. I want to start with I want to start with the special session uh, on property insurance. Uh, as many of you know, um, the legislature did very, very little uh, during the regular session on, on to address the property insurance issue. Uh, the, the property, the business um, insurance industry. Um, we're talking about uh, the number of fraudulent claims, uh, the number of frivolous lawsuits that were filed. And one thing I, I learned during that is, is that just about 9% of all of the homeowners claims filed in the United States are filed in Florida. In contrast, 79% of all the lawsuits filed related to those claims um, originates in Florida. 
So the objective going into the special session was not to reduce the rates that, that the homeowners pay. The objective was to stabilize the insurance market before the 2022 hurricane season. There were two bills, there were about a dozen or so bills that were filed, only two, uh, two were passed, 2D and 4D. Um, and Senate Bill 2D created a reinsurance to assistance policyholder or RAP program for insurance. Uh, it authorizes $2 billion in general revenue uh, to help with reinsurance. And again, this occurred at, at no, um, no cost to the insurer. An additional $150 million uh, was put into the My Safe Florida Home Program uh, to be used for hurricane mitigation inspections and matching grants. One important thing that came out of that also is the fact that insurers can now require a separate roof deductible, and that can exceed 2% of the policy um, for the dwelling limits or 50% of the cost to replace the roof. If your roof is 15 years uh, or older, um, the insurer has to allow you to have your roof inspected before they require the replacement of the roof um, as a condition of either renewing or writing a new policy. Um, and insurance companies can't refuse to write uh, the policy uh, if your roof is less than 15 years old based solely on the age of the, of the roof. And if your inspection, if you do an inspection and it shows that the roof has five years or longer of useful life, then the insurance companies can't refuse to write a new policy or renew your existing policy based solely on the age of your roof. One of the big issues um, that is added to this cost um, of insurance is um, attorney multipliers. Um, and the legislature ratcheted down the circumstances under which these attorney fee multipliers could be awarded. Uh, and there are very rare and very exceptional circumstances uh, before a, an attorney could get the multipliers. If your roof is more than 25% damaged, uh, but it complies with the 2007 Florida Building Code, then you have the option of repairing the roof instead of replacing the roof. The legislature also um, addressed some of the issues that came out of the collapse of the um, Champlain condominiums and, and Sunrise. Uh, and to make condominiums safer, um, the legislature now requires uh, what they call structural integrity reserve studies to be done. And, and that determines how much money the, the condominium association sets aside for repairs. If the building uh, is three stories or higher and it's been occupied for 30 years or more, then visual inspections are required. Uh, and they also, those inspections are required if, if the condominium has been occupied for at least 25 years, if it's within three miles of, of the coastline. Um, and again, every 10 years thereafter, there are requirements for inspections, or if any kind of substantial deviation or issue arises, uh, that, that would also trigger the need for inspection. And the results of those inspections have to be made available to building officials, uh, the, the condominium owners, and if they're trying to sell the condominium to the prospective buyer. One other bill that was filed during the regular session, House Bill 7, is the Individual Freedom, or it's commonly referred to as the, the Stop Woke Act. Uh, and it expands the, the uh, it restricts the way certain race-related concepts can be taught in schools uh, and in workplace training. Uh, if you're an employer and you have 15 or more employees, um, any, any diversity training or any mandatory training that, that you uh, put your employees through um, have, to, have to address certain race-related concepts very carefully. On one hand, um, it, it doesn't prohibit the discussion, but it does prohibit the discussion if that discussion uh, makes your employees uh, feel uncomfortable. Um, 
So if it's uh, if if you address these these concepts in a very objective, um, non-judgmental way, and you do it in a way that doesn't make your employees feel uncomfortable, um, then then you can do it. Um, so we will see on that. Um, now I'd like to turn over to Meg Canan to talk about some of the education bills that were passed. Hi. So we are starting with student assessments. This new program is called FAST, standing for the Florida Assessment of Student Thinking. The program institutionalizes progress monitoring. So FAST will be using three short computer-based tests administered throughout the year. Teachers receive results in one week and parents within two. Progress monitoring is meant to lower the stress of high stake tests and better enable data informed support for students provided by both the school and parents. The law emphasizes reporting to parents, students progress, deficiencies, and potential reading disabilities. Critics worry progress monitoring equates to more testing and doesn't truly end high stake testing. The final test administered in the spring is still an accountability tool to measure the effectiveness of teachers and students readiness for grade level promotion. Our next law that we'll look at is the parental rights in education. Proponents claim this law will, will help empower guardians to make choices regarding their child's upbringing, but critics claim the bill unfairly targets the LGBTQ community and will make it harder for youths to find support. The full implications of this law are still unclear. The preamble uses the word discussion instead of instruction, calling into question the scope of the law. The law also claims that you cannot have instruction of sexual orientation or gender identity that is not in a manner that is age appropriate in accordance with the state standards, meaning we are unsure how this law may influence older grade levels. The law's effects will be more clear when the Florida Department of Education releases updated frameworks and standards regarding school counseling, educator practices, and other student services influenced by the conduct of school personnel. The law requires these updates by June 30th, 2023. Our next law is school safety. This law received unanimous support from the House and Senate in hopes of improving school safety. Initially, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas MSD High School Public Safety Commission was established to create statewide recommendations for safer schools. Now, the MSD Commission is tasked with monitoring the implementation of school safety legislation until July 1st, 2026. The law also has provisions addressing emergency notifications, family reunifications amid emergencies, and personnel trainings for staff. Our next law is post-tenure review. The Board of Governors may adopt a regulation requiring each tenured state university faculty member to undergo a comprehensive post-tenure review every five years. Before this law, post-tenure reviews were the responsibility of faculty at state universities. Proponents support the reviews as a way to ensure accountability. Critics worry that since the Board of Governors is an appointed entity, the review process risks politicizing higher education. Our next law is curriculum transparency. This law influences the book selection process for school media centers and instructional materials. Its goal is to give parents greater influence as to what their students are exposed to. Critics worry that such reviews could be limiting to an academic environment and enable censorship. Districts will be responsible for developing a process for determining how to resolve objections from parents or county residents, so the scope of the law will depend on the choices of localities. Next, we have charter schools. Historically, school districts are the entities approving charter school applications. This new entity, the Charter School Review Commission, CSRC, is an additional venue to receive approval. Regardless of which entity approves a charter school, the school district remains the school's supervisor and sponsor. The law strives to increase students' opportunities to attend charter schools and to ensure charter school students benefit from best practices. This is why the Institute for Charter School Innovation at Miami-Dade College is part of this law. However, critics worry about how the law may influence the relationship between charter schools and school districts. Next, we have the Dorothy Huckel Financial Literacy Act. Former Senator Dorothy Huckel, who passed away in 2018, 
spent years advocating for the enactment of financial literacy within schools. And her words say it best, our students should be entering the workforce, going to college or vocational technical school with the skills to manage their financial resources effectively for a lifetime of financial security. So based upon this premise, students entering high school in the fall of 2023 and beyond will be required to have a half credit of financial literacy or personal finance and as a graduation requirement. The law passed with unanimous support in the House and Senate. To you, Bob. Okay, thank you, Meg. Um, one bill that got quite a bit of attention during the session was Senate Bill 524 that dealt with elections. And this bill created within the Department of State um, the Office of Election Crimes and Security. Uh, and they are tasked with uh, investigating um, voting irregularities. Uh, this office will consist of, there'll be 15 staff members who will investigate um, fraud, and there'll be 10 police officers who will investigate election crimes. Uh, legislature appropriated about $3.7 million uh, to run this office. Um, of concern is the fact, <clears throat> excuse me, that the, the law doesn't identify the election crimes and irregularities that this police force will, um, will investigate. Um, so the, the bill as passed is, is, is vague. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's undefined and uh, the, this police force uh, will be given uh, a lot of leeway uh, in terms of, of what they investigate. We want to shift now to uh, the environmental laws that were passed and Meg, I will turn it back to you. Thank you, Bob. So our first bill is resiliency. The Office of Resilience originates from a 2019 executive order. So this is an entity that we already have. However, with the passage of this bill, it is now codified into law. The Office of Resilience is meant to provide strategic direction for interagency initiatives to minimize the vulnerabilities to floods. The law specifically addresses a need for states transportation systems and for our smaller cities and counties to be ready to withstand floods. While the law received a lot of support from the House and Senate, critics want more action. The law only provides for protection and mitigation and critics hope that in the future the underlying causes to flooding will be addressed as well. Our next law is inventories of critical wetlands. With nearly unanimous support within the House and Senate, the purpose of acquiring wetlands is to protect Florida from erosion, sea level rise, and toxins. The listed lands will be acquired through the Land Acquisition Trust Fund. Owners of any property must be notified that their land may be on the list and they are able to request removal. Lastly, for environmental laws, we're going to look at nutrient application rates. Best management practices are practical measures for agricultural producers to reduce pollutants entering the state's water resources. When enrolled within the state's best management practices program, agricultural producers receive a presumption of compliance with the state's water quality standards. UF's IFAS, Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, provides expertise that aids the adoption and implementation of best management practices. This law will allow certified professionals outside of IFAS to give site-specific recommendations while maintaining a presumption of compliance with water standards. So this wouldn't be the same as if they practice the best management practices, they are still considered as in compliance with water standards. While this law can help farmers with specific needs, critics worry that allowing sources of recommendations outside of IFAS may lead to additional pollutants and contrasting practices. IFAS is also charged with determining site-specific nutrient management for crops other than citrus, indicating an intention to expand this system to other crops in the future. Okay, the legislature also uh, passed a couple of bills that affect how government operates, one of which was House Bill 7049 that affords governmental agencies an option of placing legal notices uh, and on their website instead of noticing them in the local newspaper. Um, and there's a reason why the Florida Constitution requires 
meetings where public business is discussed uh, to be properly noticed and to be open to the public. And that's to make sure that citizens can hold government officials accountable. Uh, historically, uh, there are a number of things appear in these public notices, uh, uh, including notice of meetings and, and hearings, uh, proposed local government and school board budgets, uh, government contracts, public bidding and procurement things all show up in the legal notice of the local newspapers. And this will let local governments put those notices on their website instead. And that works great for people who have uh, access to uh, a high speed, uh, reliable internet. But there are a number of portions in the state uh, and probably close to a million Floridians do not have access to uh, affordable and reliable broadband internet. So I, I, it, it will definitely be a disadvantage to those people. Another thing the legislature did is they reauthorized Visit Florida, which is our, our tourism marketing partnership through the year 2028. Um, the House and Senate filed different versions of that bill. Uh, the Senate wanted uh, an eight year extension, the House wanted a five year extension, and that is ultimately what they did. They extended it through October of, of, um, of 2028. Legislature also appropriated $50 million in non-recurring money uh, to, to fund Visit Florida. I want to shift now to health care uh, bills. Uh, TaxWatch, as you know, has, has been a proponent of removing the barriers to make telehealth and telemedicine more available to folks. Um, Senate Bill 312 was passed. Um, and the bill as originally, what it, what it does is it removes a lot of the prior restrictions on prescriptions. So there are now uh, Schedule II drugs can be subscribed if certain conditions exist. So this will make it easier for uh, patients to get their prescriptions refilled uh, through telehealth. The original bills that were filed had uh, an audio provision where um, you, could, you could call in on the phone and, and get these done, but that, uh, the Senate approved that. Um, the House uh, took the audio uh, phone call provisions out of the bill, um, despite their value during uh, the, the COVID pandemic. Abortion and abortion bill was passed. Um, and that's all we're going to say about that. The uh, No Patient Left Alone Act. Um, it's designed to make sure that family members can visit um, their patients in, in healthcare facilities even during a pandemic. Um, it guarantees families a, a fundamental right to visit their loved ones. Um, in addition, uh, the law prohibits healthcare facilities from requiring a vaccine as a condition of visitation. Uh, and every healthcare facility has to allow their residents and patients to be hugged by their loved ones. Senate Bill 804 changed the standards for nursing home staffing. Um, and rather than read those to you, um, the, the bill essentially loosens the staffing standards. Uh, in mid January, more than 85% of the nursing homes reported. Uh, that they had to limit admissions because they didn't have enough employees to meet the current staff standards. Um, so with this law, those standards are relaxed and nursing homes that, that don't meet these new standards uh, will no longer be barred from admitting new residents. Uh, patient advocates have expressed concern that the bill, uh, by lowering the standards of care, um, that it's, it's, they'll be doing that without um, increasing the amount of staff. Administration of vaccines, uh, House Bill 1209 uh, authorizes uh, qualified uh, pharmacy technicians to administer certain immunizations under the um, supervision of a, of a supervised pharmacist, registered pharmacist. Um, Senate Bill 7014 extended uh, the length of time that healthcare providers will get uh, protection from civil liability um, related to COVID-19 related claims. So it essentially extends at about 14 months. Uh, the, the existing uh, protections would have, would have expired in 
March of 2022, and the legislature has extended those to uh, June of 2023. And I would now like to turn the, the program over to Kurt Winter to talk about some of the things the legislature did related to taxes and taxation. Kurt? Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go through the, the tax bills. Let me start my video, my video there. <clears throat> um, the legislature passed a fairly significant tax package this year, House Bill 7071. Um, it's depending on how you count it, uh, it's going to save taxpayers about 1.1 billion, which is how the legislature counted it. Um, it's largely temporary cuts, uh, not you know non-recurring like sales tax holidays, and it focused more on providing relief to individual taxpayers than uh, businesses. There's relatively little relief in there for businesses. Um, the uh, well, it's actually the second biggest one in there is the a gas tax holiday, which is going to be a month long an attempt to um, help ease the pressure of increased uh, gas prices. Um, it'll save about a little more than 25 cents per gallon in state taxes, uh, about $200 million. One thing the legislature did was with the um, federal coronavirus uh, recovery fund money, uh, they're taking $200 million of that and putting it back on the insurance protection trust fund. Um, so that's not impacted by this holiday. So it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of visible impact this has on gas prices, particularly when you know it fluctuates so, so rapidly. Uh, could you go to the next slide for me? There was also a lot of sales tax exemptions, both holidays and temporaries and a few um, permanent ones. There is a sales tax holiday um, for back to school, which you know we have almost every year. They expanded it this year beyond just clothing, school supplies uh, and computers to, uh, they ex uh, expanded the school supply section to include any kind of learning tools. And this even includes things like jigsaw puzzles and uh, kids building blocks. Um, and so, and it's also increased the limit on school supplies it used to be about $15 to 50. So um, it's, a, it's a significant increase in um, the amount of savings that are available. Uh, there is also um, another, as they did last year, another Freedom Week. Um, holiday, which is for recreation. It's tickets to just about any kind of a sports or, or arts event, um, any uh, outdoor activity supplies, you know, boating, sports. So there's a, a lot of stuff available there. It's actually starting in a couple of days and people seem to like it last year. So they did another one. Another one that happens often is uh, the disaster preparedness. Um, that actually has occurred and it's uh, worth about 25 million. Y'all are probably familiar with that. Um, a lot of things to help with disaster preparedness. One thing that it did for this year, uh, the Girl Scouts came to the legislature and lobbied to include pet uh, evacuation things to protect pets during disasters. But it even includes things like um, pet food and, um, a litter, so that's a, another expansion. And then there's the tool tax exemption, which is a new one, about $12 million. And it's basically any kind of uh, tools used by skilled workers, but you know anybody can buy them and things like uh, you know work gloves and tool belts and things like that. So those are the four sales tax holidays. There's also some temporary sales tax exemptions, which are really like longer holidays. Uh, there's a two year exemption for impact uh, resistant windows and doors. That's been tried for a while. That is actually the biggest one in, in here is $205 million. Uh, diapers and clothes 
uh, baby clothes for toddlers and babies, um, one year, 75 million. You know, the diaper one is something that's been talked about for some time. It finally got over the hump this year. Uh, another one year for Energy Star appliances, that's energy efficient, you know, washer, dryers, uh, refrigerators. Um, and then there's a, um, a smaller one, three months for children's books, about $3 billion. There are some permanent sales tax exemptions, but they're generally rather small. The total of them all is $45 million. Uh, the mobile, the tax on the purchase of new mobile homes was reduced from six to three, cutting it in half. There's also full exemptions for uh, uh, equipment to produce green hydrogen, which has a lot of promise in energy efficiency, um, agricultural fencing and farm trailers, and they're going to add Formula One races, World Cup uh, events, and Daytona 500 tickets to the you know current long list of exemptions we have for various sporting events. Uh, go to the next one, please, Bob. Thank you. There's also some uh, property tax changes. The biggest one in terms of dollars is they uh, another thing they've been trying to do for a year that, for a while and they finally did it is they increased the five hundred dollar widow blind and disabled exemption to five thousand dollars that's for forty six point seven million. They also had the several changes that are smaller in terms of dollars, but uh, you know changes involving residential buildings impacted by catastrophic events in response to the Surfside tragedy. Uh, there's a change to how the affordable housing um, uh, exemption is calculated or when it starts. Uh, there's a new uh, exemption for uh, some aquaculture company um, property, and they, they expanded the deployed service uh, member um, uh, exemption. There's some tax credits, a new Corporate income tax credit for short line, short line rail investment. That's a new one. But they also increased the cap from three existing ones. Uh, the New World's Reading Initiative, which was passed uh, last year, uh, the, com the community contribution, and the strong family tax credits. And, and those all apply to multiple taxes. They also provided an exemption for federal emergency loans, uh, such as the uh, Paycheck Protection Loans passed um, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, that's something that the Florida Tax Watch Tax Advisory Council recommended. And those are the taxes. One thing that hasn't got as much is uh, there's actually also a tax increase in there. It has to do with corporate uh, income tax. Uh, many of you may have heard me talk about this before. I'll try to be brief. But um, the bill, the tax package, one of the provisions adopted the IRS code. They piggybacked with it like uh, we usually do. In there, there is a uh, change that will cost um, any business that is uh, that does research and development has been taking that credit. Um, they now have to, instead of fully expensing it, they're gonna have to spread that out over some time. It's actually estimated to have a pretty significant hit. And if that was included in the, if every, if all of it was included in the estimate, the, the actual savings from the tax package would be much lower. They do count the first year savings of about, uh, I mean, increase in revenue by about 47 million and the recurring of 90, but um, they don't account for in the first three years, it's about an $800 million tax increase. And, you know, this comes on top of the fact that the corporate income tax rate, which has been uh, temporarily reduced, is going back to five point, has gone back to 5.5% uh, and applied to the, the larger base because of the Federal Tax Reform Act. That's already going to be a significant increase on, uh, on Florida corporations. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, we, we want to shift now to the um, three proposed constitutional amendments that were placed on the November ballot by actions of the Florida legislature. Uh, one amendment deals with um, the, the assessed value of your property if you, ma if you make uh, flood proofing or make your home more resistant to, to storms. 
Uh, the second constitutional amendment would eliminate the uh, Constitutional Revision Commission, and the third constitutional amendment would uh, provide an additional homestead exemption to certain specified uh, frontline type public servants. So, Kurt, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the first proposed constitutional amendment? Yeah, the first um, proposed one, uh, Amendment 1, it was actually uh, the joint resolution was passed the last session in 2021, but it's going to be on this uh, upcoming ballot. And it uh, provides that the legislature can pass a law to say that um, any improvements to residential property to improve that property's resistance uh, to flood damage cannot be used in determining um, the assessed value of such property uh, for tax purposes. You know, this joins the um, already existing exemptions for um, improvements for uh, to improve the uh, resistance to wind damage and also the installation of solar on renewable energy sources. Um, we think that largely this is a good idea um, as you know, it, it will help incentivize people to take some of the steps to improve resiliency, which the legislature did a lot, has done a lot to um, kind of promote that idea in the last couple of years. Um, I don't know if Bob mentioned, but we have a, uh, um, we will be having a, uh, a constitutional, a voter guide to these constitutional amendments coming out uh, in, a, in a month or so. Uh, so look forward to that. You can get more information. I'll turn it back to um, Bob for Amendment 2. Thank you, Kurt. The Second Amendment would abolish uh, Florida's Constitution Revision Commission. Um, Florida is the only state that has a Constitution Revision Commission. Uh, it meets every 20 years to consider amendments to the Constitution. Uh, it last met in 2017 and 18. Uh, if the Constitution Revision Commission were to be abolished, uh, there would still be four ways to amend the Florida Constitution, all of which would require voter approval. Um, this, this proposal received uh, very broad uh, bipartisan support. Uh, it was, the, the, the resolutions were passed out of the House and Senate uh, uh, unanimously or, or, or almost unanimously. Um, the idea of getting rid of the CRC has been uh, supported by uh, conservative um, organizations like Americans for Prosperity. And it's also been supported by uh, liberal organizations like the National Organization of Women and the Florida Policy Action Network. Um, those of you who remember the 2017-18 um, CRC uh, will remember the, the, um, the concerns that were expressed about the bundling of proposals. Um, Five of the seven measures that were on the ballot uh, in 2018 uh, included more than one subject issue. One that is um, pointed out the most often is the, the one that would have um, prohibited vaping in public, space, public workspaces uh, and would also uh, restrict offshore oil drilling. So. Uh, you, you may like to vape uh, and would not vote for that, but um, you, to, to get one of these measures, you have to approve both of them. Uh, the Supreme Court has looked at that and said that, that, that is, that's acceptable, that there it, is, it doesn't violate uh, the Constitution to do that. Um, those who oppose abolishing the Constitution Revision Commission um, argue that, that um, the, the people have to have a way to bring issues uh, to the ballot if the legislature refuses to act. And as Kurt pointed out, we'll be releasing our voter guide uh, in the end of September of this year, and we will uh, go into a much more in-depth analysis of the pros and cons of each of these, and uh, along with a, a recommendation from Tax Watch. The last constitutional amendment um, is an additional homestead exemption for a certain class of public servants. So Kurt, can you talk to us about that? 
Sure. Um, this was a, a joint resolution passed by the legislature. Let's bring in an, um, an amendment, a proposed amendment to the ballot in November. It would provide uh, frontline workers, what they're calling them, to a new homestead exemption of $50,000. This would be any homestead property owned by teachers, law enforcement officers, correction officers, firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics, also child welfare services professionals and active uh, duty members of the armed forces or the, the National Guard. This would basically um, double the current homestead exemption for uh, this, this class. Um, everybody's uh, first $25,000 will still be exempt from, from all property taxes. And the other existing one that covers from 50 to 75,000 um, on just school taxes will remain. And now for these people, there will be a new $50,000 from 100,000 to 150. So there's still two parts in there, uh, $50,000 before you get to this that you have to pay taxes on, but this will help. It's gonna save um, this class about uh, 80 to $90 million a year. Now it'll save them that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's gonna cost local governments that. You know, Generally, Florida Tax Watch has been wary of um, reducing um, things that reduce taxable value because <coughs> as you may know, the way the property tax system works, generally when you uh, reduce one area, it ends up just shifting tax more than cutting it in, in the broad sense. Certainly the people that qualify for the exemption are gonna get some savings. But we feel that since this is such a, um, you know, what, what these people provide is so important and it's relatively a, a small uh, token of the state's gratitude. Um, we think it's, it's probably a good idea. So um, that's another thing that we'll be able to vote on in November and um, I will turn it back to Bob. Thank you, Kurt. Um, and, and again, one of the advantages of, of going through all of this material as quickly as we did is, is that we have left a little bit of time for questions and answers. But before we go into that, um, I just want to thank Meg and Kurt for um, helping me with this webinar today. Um, I want to reiterate something Tony mentioned a little earlier about uh, the future webinars. Um, at the end of August, We'll have a webinar on U.S. Census uh, and the American Community Survey that, that supports the U.S. Census. In September, um, our webinar will focus on uh, United to Safeguard America from Illegal Trade. that will look at uh, counterfeit goods and, and things like that. And then in October, we're going to look at environment and the economy. A couple of other things uh, I would like to uh, re remind everyone um, what Kurt said, we're going to be releasing the voter guide in the end of September. Um, we're also later today going to be releasing our budget guide. Uh, and this is a document Kurt Winter puts together. It is a detailed analysis of the fiscal year 22-23 uh, budget. And then finally, I would remind everyone to um, save the date. The Tax Watch Fall meeting will be uh, November 30th through December 2nd at the Biltmore and Coral Gables. And I hope, um, hope you'll join us there. So with that, we can um, take some questions. Bob, thanks. This is Tony. I think one of the things that uh, I'll just mention is you left one of the most controversial bills off of the discussion, and that was the switch from the key lime pie to the strawberry shortcake. I think that that was just one of those big critical issues that absolutely needs to be discussed in this state. So we have an opportunity for a few questions. Uh, if you have anything that you'd like to submit while we're on the line, go ahead and include it in the chat or on the Q&A feature. 
Uh, otherwise, I do want to point out that you can email either bnave at Florida Tax Watch or tcarvajal at floridataxwatch.org, and we'll get back to you after this. Um, maybe for each of you, one of the final questions I'd ask is, okay, as you think into uh, next year, what are some of the broad issues that we need to be thinking about given what we've learned this this last year? Uh, I do want to uh, thank Randall for submitting the question about the uh, Stop Woke Act. As you know, that's about DEI training. And the question was, uh, do we have any clear guidance on what that means or what that does not mean? Reality is we do not yet but we'll follow up after this program with uh, the administration, find out if they have any targeted timelines for um, guidance uh, for employers on that. Uh, my personal opinion is that uh, we probably won't get anything anytime soon. The, uh, the bill has some automatic triggers that will allow somebody to um, file some actions first, and that I think will will speed up some of the items, but for Randall and all others interested in the, uh, in the uh, just, um, the DEI training. We'll get you some of those answers and look for that in our upcoming newsletters. There were a few bills, and Kurt, maybe you want, want to mention a, a few items on this that were vetoed, uh, and uh, Tax Watch played a big uh, role in that, uh, or some things that didn't cross the uh, the finish line, like investments in um, telecommunications and broadband. But many of those were covered in the budget. Uh, uh, Kurt, did I hear correctly that the budget guide is coming out now? And any any highlights uh, or anything that you want to mention from the um, the last budget that we just passed? Well, um, yeah, it is coming out uh, this afternoon, I believe. And um, it's you may have seen them in the past. We've been doing them every year. It basically looks at the budget, and by the budget we mean all appropriations for this upcoming fiscal year, the General Appropriations Act is not the only thing that appropriates uh, money for this year. Um, there's some things in what they call the back of the bill for this year, which for some reason are back there instead and don't count in the total set uh, that are publicized, the $112 billion budget. Uh, we also take uh, any appropriations made in general bills during the session and they're included in there as well. And we also adjust for the governor's vetoes, which as you know, were pretty significant this year. He vetoed uh, $3.1 billion in line item vetoes. Not all of that actually reduces the budget, uh, but it does reduce the budget by a little over $2 billion. So um, that was a record uh, veto. Um, and he did it, um, end up vetoing a lot of things highlighted by our budget turkey watch report, but it's a, a very large budget and uh, there was a lot of money available this year. And so, um, uh, you know, they could do this and make a lot of investments. They could and still have record uh, budget reserves. So we still have a lot of money in the bank. Um, you know, money's been coming in pretty fast and furious. The federal dollars actually helped and one thing I'll say is another thing that the budget doesn't count is the three and a half billion dollars in coronavirus relief funds that were also appropriated in, in the back of the bill. They're not part of that $112 billion. Tony mentioned broadband. There is a, a, a bill that didn't make it, but they did put in the $400 million there for uh, to help increase um, broadband ac access to unserved areas, which we think is a, a major um, economic development issue and uh, we're glad to see it. So look for the uh, the budget guide. There's a lot of good information in there. It also puts it in historical context. So you'll see uh, how it compares to past budgets and uh, we look at it in a lot of different ways. So look out for that. Tony, one other bill that uh, was vetoed last week, uh, Senate Bill 620, which would have allowed businesses to sue local governments if the local government passed an ordinance um, or charter provision that reduced the business's profits by 15% or more. Uh, Tax Watch was very concerned uh, about that bill. Um, the, the fact that uh, it could uh, spur a, a lot of uh, predatory and frivolous lawsuits. Uh, it would raise the, the legal bills of local governments. It would affect their ability to raise money. 
Uh, and, and eventually, uh, you know, when local governments have to increase their costs, they have one of two ways to do it. They either cut services or they raise taxes, and both of those uh, would adversely affect um, the taxpayer, and um, we were glad to see the governor veto that bill. And there was a, a Department of Revenue bill that also got uh, vetoed, and actually there was some progress made in, in clearing up some of those items, but just want to, to know that we are working on forming a task force uh, to to clarify some of the the rights that were being infringed on, as well as some of the things that need to be fixed in in that bill. Uh, Kurt, I know that uh, you'll probably take a lead on that process. Anything? Uh, if somebody wants to reach you now to to be part of that, uh, it's K Wenner at FloridaTaxWatch.org. So uh, one of the questions that did just come in is about the uh, broadband equity access and deployment programs and things about uh, making sure that we have access across the state. Bob, you had mentioned that one of the big problems that we still have in this state is that uh, not everybody actually has access to broadband or, or high-speed communications. Uh, you did a research project on that uh, this last session. There's more work to be done though, isn't there? There is. And, and one of the good things that came out of the session was the legislature appropriated $400 million to go into the Department of Environmental Opportunities uh, broadband grant program. Uh, and the DEO is working closely with the regional planning councils and local governments to, to get a handle on where broadband uh, starts and stops uh, to better define these unserved and underserved areas. Uh, but the good thing is um, DEO um, will now have some money that they can pass through to local governments to, to get a better handle on broadband. Yeah, so we're, uh, the state's asking for your assistance in testing high-speed connections around the state. If you we can uh, look in the next newsletter, we'll send you some details about how to test the speed around the state. But keep an eye on that because uh, connectivity is a big part of uh, future economy. And, and this is gonna be a big part as we go forward. Hey, Meg, I know that you've been uh, taking a lead on some of our census and ACS work, and you'll be discussing some of those items coming up in August, just at a high level. Uh, how did uh, we do in this last census? And uh, are we looking good for federal dollars coming into the state or did we take a black eye again? Thanks, Tony. So we have an undercount of 3.48% according to the US Census Bureau. And we are one of few states, I think one of six with a statistically significant undercount, meaning we definitely miss some people and it is going to take a hit to our federal funding that are, is based upon how many people are in our state. Yeah, that's not a new thing, but uh, the numbers are pretty high this uh, this last time. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about that in August. And I know you're working on a paper that uh, we're planning on releasing in, in terms of what we can do in the meantime, because while this has a consequence for, for 10 years, there's uh, things in between, like the American Community Survey, ACS, that, that we might be paying attention to. All right, uh, another question here on sales tax. Uh, maybe, I guess this is much more because they heard this at our spring meeting. Uh, speaker designate Renner asked uh, folks to uh, submit suggestions on sales tax exemptions that maybe should be lifted and stuff. Kurt, we've got a uh, task force that we're going to uh, launch uh, later this year and submit some recommendations on that. Any any high level ideas or thoughts on that uh, that, that we could share at this moment? Well, you know, the idea of uh, sales tax exemptions and the potential uh, review of them is a real uh, complex, difficult, and sticky situation. Um, everybody has all the exemptions, still have supporters somewhere. Um, and the question is, you know, when does good tax relief become unnecessary uh, exemptions? You know, exemptions generally kind of distort uh, tax policy, uh, a good tax policy that's fairness and equity and you know uh, simplicity so you have to make sure that when you do exempt something that it serves a purpose and exemptions tend to stay in the budget forever uh, or in law forever so we're going to be looking at that um, we've done some work in the past on exemptions you know you hear about all the exemptions that exist about how more is exempt than taxable that's not really true when you look at it there's big chunks that have to be exempt, uh, either by controlling um, law or, you know, 
people count services, which really just aren't part of a sales tax. Um, and there's also, you know, some life's necessities, which uh, some people think that might not help. But, uh, you know, we do without a income tax, we have a fairly uh, regressive tax system. And so uh, necessities are something that certainly I can understand why people would want to exempt. So we're going to be looking at all of the ones, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Ch Ch uh, Speaker Renner said, um, you know, that he wanted us to have, find uh, sales tax turkeys, which are, you know, I don't know if that's going to be the best uh, term for them, but we're going to try to find ones that uh, maybe don't serve the purpose they were intended to or may not provide a real benefit to the state. Well, we're pretty good at hunting turkeys, uh, it seems, this last year. Congratulations to you and the whole team for, for that research. Okay, uh, team, we're coming up to the last few minutes in this process, so maybe the question I'll ask for you is, um, what do you think is coming up this next year that we need to be thinking about? And uh, as you think about your answer and get ready for a quick round robin on this one, I just want to encourage each of you who are uh, watching this program to submit your suggestions on what we should be uh, working on over the next uh, coming year. Uh, in November, we'll uh, seat a new legislative cohort and <clears throat> the legislative session will start in March of next year. But this is an excellent time for you to be suggesting research projects and partnering with us on work that we'll be doing. Uh, I should mention that you can go to floridataxwatch.org and look at our research page if you want to find out the types of works that we had influence on this last year. If you have suggestions, you can reach out to, to Bob, Kurt, myself, or Meg uh, and uh, submit those ideas. You know, I don't think that uh, many of the issues that uh, were addressed this last year, whether they were uh, um, completed or not, are, are going away. We're still going to have questions about insurance. We're still going to have questions uh, around uh, how to manage business operations and, and taxes and audits and, and those types of things. Uh, chances are that the Business Protection Act and, and the audit process will come up again, uh, as will uh, broadband and, and other issues. So we'll have a repeat uh, to some degree of many of the issues that, that we had this last year. And that's just the way this process works. It's, it's an iterative uh, learning, re-energizing uh, process. But if you've got one of those items that uh, you'd like to see us working on, uh, great time to let us know now and look forward to partnering with you that on those items. So um, I'll start with you, Bob, then I'll go to Meg and Kurt. And, uh, you know, what do you think you're going to see this next year? What are you going to be working on as we lead into the next legislative session? Well, three issues that, that are important to me. Uh, one is affordable housing. Uh, there are so many Floridians simply can't afford to live near where they work. So they have long commutes. And when you couple that with the price of gas these days, uh, that, that just creates uh, additional problems for those folks. Uh, water quality and quantity is always at the top of my list. Uh, I've, I've felt that what the, the availability of water uh, will dictate where growth continues to occur in the state. Uh, and then finally is, is the, the insurance issue. Uh, as I said earlier, the objective of the special session wasn't to uh, provide immediately immediate relief to uh, policyholders. It was to stabilize the market before the hurricane season came. Uh, so I think at some point there will be additional pressure on legislators to do something to lower the rates. Thanks, Bob. Matt? I'm going to echo Bob. I think affordable housing is really going to rise as an issue, especially as we're seeing inflation and like Bob said, the rising gas prices. But I also think that our current administration is very interested in workforce development. And I think that that will be another interesting thing to watch develop as this year progresses. Thanks, Kurt. Your thoughts? Well, uh, in one word, money again. Um, we have a lot of it. Uh, there's uh, $11.9 billion in, in reserves right now. And um, that number, when the General Revenue Estimating Conference gets together in August, is going to go up significantly. Uh, you know, Florida has, is already well above the pre pandemic le levels in revenue collections. Mm -hmm. um, and with uh, corporate income taxes are going to be rising significantly. We think that sales tax exemptions due to the uh, remote sales tax law are going to continue to come in higher than um, the state has uh, estimated. Um, already, 
it's something like 20 year, 20 months in a row, estimates, uh, actual collections of beat estimates. And they continue to do so uh, last year. So for this month is, I mean, last month, uh, the estimates for this month, should, our actual collections will be coming out soon for, for this month. And we'll see if that continues. But uh, again, there's going to be a, an awful lot of money and we um, are going to try to look at ways to give some of that back to the taxpayers. We're trying to formally light a, a, a list of the best ways to potentially do that. Certainly, we might like to see a speed up of the um, demise of the business rent tax. Uh, we figured out a way last year to kind of do that at a very low cost. Uh, so we'll probably be pushing on that again. And there's some issues in um, economic development, like making sure, uh, although they extended Visit Florida this year, we'd like to see it made uh, permanent. And we'd like to, uh, we think that bringing back the uh, QTI program, the quality, Qualified Target Industry uh, program would be a, a good thing for Florida. So those are just a couple of things that we'll be looking at next year. Well, we've got a broad range of issues on, on the agenda. Some of the things that I've been looking at include water infrastructure. Bob, I think you're right on target um, with those items. Uh, Meg, I know that we've been talking about workforce issues. And one of those side issues is the impact of child care on Florida's economy and, and look for some papers and commentaries on that. The sales tax exemptions, all the money that's sitting around and, and everything that we do uh, for the budgets and the turkeys, clearly um, some other uh, items that already been mentioned, sales tax exemptions, work in progress. Uh, I, I do think that there's a, a few items on procurement. Uh, we've got questions left open on the independent special districts. We've got um, education funding questions and, and how do we go forward on those issues, privatization questions, how to manage P3s. There's lots that uh, we need your continued support on. So stay with us uh, at Florida Tax Watch throughout the year. We need your support. We need your ideas and we need your uh, backing on the work that we do. Go to our website at floridataxwatch.org to find the types of reports and projects that we've worked on over this next year. You can always go there in our blog section, as a matter of fact, to identify some uh, ideas. Uh, we'll post our slides from this uh, program today on, on the blog section at floridataxwatch.org. Um, and let me end with uh, just one last thing. Our team is growing. So if you've got suggestions, if you know of individuals that are, are uh, strong researchers and can work on the work that we need to protect Florida's taxpayers, uh, send them our way. Uh, over this next year, we're going to be doing more work and more projects, and we're adding more team members. So with that, uh, I'll uh, thank you all for joining us and look forward to uh, our next conversation, our webinar, August 31st on. Census and the American Community Survey. Thank you for joining us today.